It's a joy to be with you this morning. Would you take your copy of God's Word and turn to the book of John? John chapter 15. We'll begin reading there in just a moment. As we enter into a new year, it's very common for us to, uh, to pause and look back over the past year to evaluate where we were, what we've come through, and what we would hope for the new year to look like. A lot of that is outside of our control, but of course we can always look to see how we want to be growing in our own personal lives and our walk with the Lord. So it's right and good for us to evaluate our priorities and our goals for a new year, both as a church and as individuals. Because as we've just sang, we are prone to wander. We are prone to leave the God we love. And so it's important, and I think good at this time, to reevaluate our priorities as a church. So for the next three weeks, we'll be going through a short series called The Three Priorities of a Local Church. I believe that these priorities are applicable to us as individual Christians as well. And I believe our Lord has spoken about those priorities. And so we begin in John chapter 15. We'll read verses 1 through 11. If you are able, whether in body or in spirit, would you stand with me for the reading of God's word? Our Lord Jesus, the night before his crucifixion, said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Let us pray. Our God in heaven, now that we have heard your word, we submit to its instructions. Lord, would you help us now to focus on its exposition? Would you fill us with your Holy Spirit that we might understand your word? Would you soften our hearts that we may delight in you? Would you sharpen our minds that we may discern your truth? And would you shape our wills that we may desire your ways? It's in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for his glory we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The three priorities of a local church. You might be surprised to realize that not all churches agree on what should be the priority of the church. Different churches elevate and prioritize different things. And it doesn't mean that those things are necessarily bad. It's just a question of what is to be our number one priority? What is to be our second priority? And what is to be our third priority? Some churches would prioritize evangelism. Evangelism is a good thing. But they would prioritize it in such a way that everything they do focuses in on evangelism to the exclusion of the other good things that Christ has called us to do. Other churches would prioritize missions. Missions is a good thing. But if it's prioritized to the exclusion of the other good things that Christ has called us to do, then it is in the wrong priority order. Other churches would prioritize theology or programs or fellowship or discipleship or counseling. All good things. And yet we have to understand what has God said must be our first priority. 
And what comes after that? And what after that? I would submit to you that our first priority as Christians and as a church is our relationship with Christ. Our second priority is our relationship with one another. And our third priority is our relationship with the world. So for these three weeks, we're going to go through each of those priorities. And I'm going to make a case from the Bible that this, these are the three priorities that God has given the local church. And under those priorities, all things fall into place. When we have these in the right order, when we love God rightly, we can rightly love one another. And when we love God rightly and we rightly love one another, we can rightly love the world around us. So all of these very good things, evangelism and missions and discipleship and fellowship, all of these good things fall into place when we have everything in the right order. So I would submit that our highest priority is to enjoy God and to know him. Our highest priority is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our mind. I believe the Bible makes that very clear. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says, whether you eat or drink, Whatsoever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Paul says in Romans, For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. And I really like the way he says it in Colossians 1.18. He says, And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything, that in all things, Christ might be preeminent. So I believe our highest priority, both as Christians and as a church, is our relationship with God through Christ. And I didn't just make these up. I believe that they're all found in the Bible, but I believe this pattern is found in the Bible. When we come to John chapter 15, the night before our Lord's crucifixion, he's giving his disciples marching orders. He's telling them that he's about to be gone and they're going to have to carry on his mission without him. And so here in John 15 and in John 17, he addresses the same order. He begins with our relationship with the Father. And then he moves to our relationship with one another. And then he moves to the relationship with the world. So I believe our Lord has given us this pattern here in the book of John. We're going to look at chapter 15. You can find the same thing in chapter 17. And I believe it's supported all throughout Scripture. But let's begin now in John chapter 15. Jesus gives us a metaphor. The first uh, six verses, he explains the metaphor. And 7 through 11, he applies the metaphor. So let's look at it. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. This would have been a very common metaphor to the 11 disciples. Judas has already left them at this point because they're in Israel and they have vineyards everywhere. Whether they're growing grapes or olives, they're very familiar with what it takes to have a vineyard, what it takes to have healthy fruit, what it takes to prune the vineyard and to care for the vineyard and to tend the vineyard. They're all very familiar with this idea, with this metaphor. And yet not only is it a way of life, it's what has been applied to Israel in the Old Testament. Israel is called the vineyard of the Lord. We read Isaiah chapter 6 as our call to worship. But right before that, in Isaiah chapter 5, God spoke clearly and directly to Israel as his vineyard. But he said, you haven't produced good fruit. You've produced rotten fruit. And because of that, you must be set aside. Israel was not the true vine. Israel was supposed to be the vessel that would send God's blessings all throughout the earth. And yet they failed. And Jesus says, I am the true vine. I am the one from which all of God's blessings will flow throughout the world. Not only that, but my father is the vine dresser. The vine dresser is the one who has absolute sovereignty over everything that happens in the vineyard. He determines what is planted. He determines what is pruned. He determines what is cut away and cast aside. And he determines what is uh, cared for and nurtured so that it may grow. The, the Father is the supreme vine dresser. He is sovereign both over the vine, Christ, and he's sovereign over the branches, us. So Jesus says, I am the true vine. And every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. 
So we have two different types of branches, and they produce two different types of fruit. And it's really important that we understand who the branches are and what the fruit is, because if we get mixed up, we're going to have a wrong application of the passage. We could talk about this at length, but I'm not going to. I want to simply say that this branch that does not bear fruit, I believe, is someone who's not a true disciple. They are a false disciple of Christ. John uses this word, disciple, to refer to people who follow after Jesus and have a vital, life-giving connection with Jesus, as well as to those who appear to have a relationship with Jesus, but at some point they walk away. At some point they say, I can't take any more of this. We see that earlier in the book of John when Jesus feeds the 5,000 and he gives them his teaching. He says, I am the bread of life. And he says something really remarkable. You don't have to turn there, but I'm going to in John chapter 6 and verses 54 through 57. He's talking to these people, these disciples, as John calls them. And here's what Jesus says. He says, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true blood, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood, this all sounds really, really ghastly, really gross, but he says, whoever does this abides in me. So even way back in John chapter 6, Jesus was setting us up for what does it mean to abide in Christ? It's to take Christ in his entirety, to encompass Christ into your life as your own, to follow after Christ with your heart and with your soul and with your mind. And what happened when some of the disciples heard this? Verse 66, after this, many of the disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. You see, when we hear the word disciple, we think of someone who's a true follower of Christ. And it's used that way in other gospels. But here in the gospel of John, he uses the word disciple to talk about both those who are true disciples and false disciples. And those false disciples are the ones who do not bear fruit and will eventually, verse 6, they will be thrown away like a branch and wither. They will be gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. You see, that sounds clearly like hell. And that's not the fate of any true Christian. So perhaps you've heard a Bible teacher explain that this passage that you can have a Christian who just simply does not bear fruit. But I would like to kindly, as I know how, tell you that that's not what the Bible teaches. Any true Christian will bear fruit. There will be different kinds of fruit. There will be different seasons of fruit. There will be different qualities of fruit. But any true Christian does produce fruit. So it's important to understand that this branch that doesn't bear fruit is a false disciple. And we've already seen it in this discourse of John when Judas betrays Jesus. You see, even as John sets up this passage beginning in chapter 13, he talked about the love that Jesus had for all of those who are his own. But then he said, but Judas, who had already had it put into his heart by Satan to betray Christ. You have the 11 true disciples and you have the one false disciple, Judas. And so they're setting up this example of what it looks like to have true disciples, to have branches that are bearing fruit, and to have false disciples, the branch who does not bear any fruit. That's the first branch. But you have a second branch, a branch that does bear fruit. The father, the master vine dresser, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You see, this word for prunes also means cleanses or purifies. You can look back at seasons of your life and you recognize that the Father was pruning you. He was cleansing you. He was purifying you. Why? So that you might bear more fruit. But Jesus is talking to those who are true disciples. Verse 3, he says, Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Jesus is talking to those who are in Christ. They have been cleansed, and the Father is going to continue to cleanse them that they might bear more fruit. You see, this metaphor of the vineyard, it is the driving image for Jesus' main point. Here's what Jesus is trying to get to with this imagery of the vineyard. He wants his true disciples to ask, what must followers of Jesus do to ensure that they are truly fruitful? Fruitful. 
What must we do to be truly connected to Christ? The answer is in verse 4. We must abide in Christ. Verse 4, he says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. He makes it explicit in verse 5. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, he can do nothing. What must the true follower, the true disciple of Christ do to have that vital life-giving relationship with Christ? We must abide in Christ. But what does that mean? The word abide means to remain. We're to remain in Christ. He's speaking to the eleven, those who are faithful. He's speaking to you, those who are in Christ. You're already in Christ. You're saved, but you're to remain in Christ. So here, here's something that I hope is helpful that was, was given to me, that don't picture a light switch that's either off or on. You're either in or you're out. Picture a dimmer switch. It's always on. The question is how dim or how bright Will it be? So he's speaking to those of us who are in Christ. Those branches that don't produce fruit, those who are false disciples, they are cast out. But those who are in Christ, the true disciples, the true branches that ought to be producing fruit, the question is how closely are you going to abide with Christ? You see, to the degree that we are vitally connected to Christ, Christ will be connected to us. The more that we nurture and cultivate that relationship, the more that we will experience the results of abiding in Christ. Let me say that again. The more that we nurture and the more that we cultivate that relationship with Christ, the more that we will experience the results of abiding in Christ. So what are the results of abiding in Christ? They're the fruit. We understand that. But again, what does that mean? How does that work? Jesus explains this metaphor. He's wanting us to ask the question, what do we need to do to abide in him? And now he applies the metaphor in verses 7 through 11. He gives us the answer there in verse 7. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. You see, if you're hearing that phrase, well, I have to abide in Christ, and you're thinking some, sor- some form of mysticism, you're thinking some type of magic, you're thinking there, there must be something secret that I've missed out on in all my years as a Christian, I don't understand what it means to abide in Christ, Jesus tells us right here, and it's not mystical. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. Notice that verses 4 and 7 are parallel. In verse 4, he says, abide in me. And I in you. There's this mutual abiding. But here in verse 7, he makes a slight switch. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. Christ is equating himself with his words. If you want Christ to dwell in you, if you want to abide in Christ, then let Christ's words abide in you. And what happens when we do that? When God speaks to us through his word, our natural response is, is that we speak back to him. When God speaks to us, we want to speak to him through prayer. That's what Jesus says. He says, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. There's a dialogue that happens when we abide in Christ. When we read God's words, and we study God's words, and we meditate on God's words, and we memorize God's words, when God's word dwells richly within us, God shapes us and forms us to think his thoughts after him. We begin to think more like Christ. And so then when we pray, when we read God's word, our natural response is to speak back to him through prayer. And when we do that, we speak God's words back to him. He's shaping us and changing us and making us more like him through his word. If you abide in me and my words abide in you. After we fill ourselves with God's word, after we hear God speak, our natural response is to speak back to him. So this mutual abiding is a dialogue. God speaks and we speak. 
God speaks and we speak. We hear him through his word and we speak his words back to him. But another way to help us understand this idea of abiding is when we look at another meaning of the word abide. We understand that abide means to remain in something, but abide also means to dwell with someone, to dwell. If you dwell with someone, they must dwell with you. And when you're dwelling with someone, you have communion with one another. You have fellowship with one another. You give something of yourself and they give something of themselves. You speak to them and they speak to you. When we dwell with one another, we have communion with one another. And so when God's words dwell in us, we have communion with God. We have fellowship with God. We have a relationship with God because of his words filling us, his words abiding in us. And therefore, we're able to speak his words back to him. We're to pray as he would have us to pray. But if you hear this and you think, oh, my goodness, this sounds like a lot of work. He's just telling us to pray and read our Bible. That's what I've heard all my life. What, wow, this sounds like just more work. But Christ doesn't intend for this to be work or a duty. He means for this to be done out of love. Notice what he says in verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. The Father has loved the Son, and the Son has loved us with that same love. And so we're to abide, we're to dwell, we're to rest and remain in that love. But how do we do that? What does that look like? He tells us in verse 10, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So the son has demonstrated his love for the father by obeying his commandments. We demonstrate our love for the son by obeying his commandments. See, there's nothing mystical about it. It's not rocket science. It's what we've been taught all our life. But if we get these priorities out of whack, if we put things in the wrong order, then nothing is going to work as it should. So we're to read God's word, to let God's word dwell in us. And let our words dwell in God through prayer. He's changing us and shaping us and forming us as we study his word. As it actually makes a difference in our lives. As we abide in his love by obeying his commandments. This is the picture that Christ is giving us. It's not to be a duty. It's to be done out of love. But what are the results? What happens when we do that? Verse 8 says, by this... My father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. If our chief goal in life is to glorify God, when we let God's words dwell in us and our words dwell in him, we bring glory to the father. Verse eight says that clearly by this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit. When we do this, we will bear fruit. If we're not doing this, we will not bear fruit. It's that simple. But when we bear fruit, notice what the end of verse 8 says. We will so prove to be his disciples. When we abide in his love, when we obey his commandments, we prove that we actually are in Christ. Now hear me carefully. We all understand this, but it needs to be repeated over and over and over. We are not saved by our works. You can do nothing to save yourself. Christ saves you. We are not saved by our good works, but we are saved for good works. The Bible makes that very clear. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2 that we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's why I believe there, there can be no such thing as a fruitless Christian because God has already prepared fruit for you before the foundations of the world. Before you were born, God already had the good works, the good deeds, the fruits prepared for you. Paul says in the book of Titus that when Christ our Savior redeemed us, he redeemed us from all lawlessness and 
and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Zealous for good works. That is what our Father in heaven, the divine vine dresser, has prepared for us. James makes it very clear when he says, Faith without works is dead. We're not saved by our works, but we are saved for our good works. And this is how we demonstrate that we are his disciples when we bear much fruit and the Father is glorified in this way. But not only is the Father glorified, but we will have joy. Look at verse 11. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. When we do these things, when we abide in Christ, when we let his words abide in us and our words abide in him through prayer, when we obey him out of love, the Father is glorified and we are filled with joy. Not just a little bit of joy, not even a whole lot of joy, but full joy, complete joy, all joy. If joy is missing from your Christian life, then perhaps it's time to, to revisit the vineyard, to look at the divine vine dresser and ask him, Lord, would you prune me in such a way that I could bear fruit for you? Would you prune me in such a way that I could be full of joy for your glory? As I mentioned, when we think about this under the heading of the priorities of the church, that our first priority is to be our relationship with Christ. I mentioned that not only is this found in John 15, but it's found again in John 17. In Jesus' high priestly prayer, he follows this same format, this same priority, that our first priority is our relationship with God through Christ, and that our second priority is our relationship with one another, and that our third priority is our relationship with the world. Jesus used these same headings, and he said uh, in verses 21 through 23 of John 17, he says this, praying to God, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. So that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. As we're trying to figure out the priorities for the church, and we know that there's many things we must do, that we must have fellowship with one another, we must grow in love for one another, that we must disciple one another, that we must be growing in good works, but that we also must be looking outwardly and we must be sharing the gospel here in Palmetto and in Georgia and around the world as we're looking to try to figure out how do we prioritize all of these things that God has given us. God has given us the answer here. He has given us our priority our marching orders. Our first priority is our communion with God through Christ. But what's the result of that? He says that they may also be one in us. When our number one priority is our relationship with Christ, then we can rightly have the unity that Jesus is speaking of in John 17. When we love God rightly, we can rightly love one another. But what else happens? Notice that he said, and the world will believe that you sent me. When we rightly love God and when we rightly love one another, we will be able to rightly love the world. And that is the most powerful witness to a lost and dying, unbelieving world. These priorities do not compete with one another. They feed one another. We must have them in the right order or nothing will work properly. We must love God supremely through Christ. We must love one another as a church, and we must rightly love the world. But what does that look like? I told you that I believe these priorities are appropriate, not just for the church, but for each of us individually. What does this look like for individual Christians? Again, it looks like what you've been taught for many years. It looks like the word and prayer. God works in us through his word. He prunes us through his word. He abides in us when his words abide in us. 
And so to that end, this year we're introducing a different Bible reading plan. Uh, some of you have, have made it a good habit of using the Bible plan that the church offers. Uh, this year you'll find in the back and down outside the office there's a Bible reading plan. It's a five-day narrative Bible reading plan. So there's a couple of things to notice about that. One is that it's designed to be read over five days and not seven. So you already have time built in for when life gets busy and you miss a day. You already have time built in to prepare for Sunday school and to prepare for the corporate worship service. Not only that, but it tells this Bible plan is designed to take us through the big story of Scripture. Many of us know some stories of Scripture, but how many of us know the story of Scripture? God's story from beginning to end. This Bible reading plan is designed to take us through the narratives of Scripture. Because I believe that stories shape us. We've all seen a good movie. We've read a good book. We've heard someone tell a good story. And we understand the impact that a story can have. And so this Bible narrative reading plan is going to take us through Genesis to Revelation. Looking at the big story of Scripture. And so for those of you who want to do that as a church. You can use that in your own personal life to help you see God's big story. What he's doing throughout the Bible. We'll have resources going along with that. We'll talk more about that at a different time. But that's one tool that you can use to help aid you in studying God's word this year. Because for God's words to abide in us, we actually have to study God's word. We actually have to read it in order to let his words dwell in us. But when God's words dwell in us, we want our words to dwell in him. We want to pray back to him. And so I hope you will have a life personally committed to prayer. As a church, it is my desire that as soon as the Lord allows us to begin gathering again on Wednesday evenings, that we will have a time of prayer, that we will have a true prayer meeting where we can cast our cares upon the Lord, but not only pray for the various uh, ailments and illnesses going on in our lives and in the lives of those that we love, but that we would also pray for God's work around the world. That we would study God's word and see what God has to say about prayer and then live it out. Then put it into practice and pray God's words back to him so that we could be a part of what God is doing through prayer. But how else does this apply to our life as a church? I believe this idea of the three priorities that our first priority should be our relationship with God through Christ should be the driving force of the organization of the church. Our first priority as a church ought to be to nurture our relationship and our communion with God through Christ. And we do that primarily through our corporate worship services. Our corporate worship services are the one time each week when the majority of us all gather together in one room to worship our risen Lord. Our worship services are not merely expressions of our relationship with God. It is that. We do express ourselves but it's more than that. Our worship services form us and they shape us. They shape our relationship with God. So understanding these priorities affects how we worship. This affects the emphasis that we place on corporate worship. It's the reason that we begin and end our services with God's word. And it's my desire that through time, our services would contain even more of God's word. Him dwelling and abiding in us. And that our services would contain even more prayer. Our words abiding in Him. This impacts the structure of the service. The songs that we sing. The scriptures that we read. The prayers that we pray. Everything we do in this service during this time shapes our hearts. And it shapes our minds. To be the kind of people who are abiding with Christ to the greatest degree. It would be my desire as your pastor that you be so shaped by God's word and what we do as a body gathering together to worship God. That when those hard times come, that when Satan tempts you, that when trials should buffet, that you would your first response would be not to turn to Facebook, not to turn to the world's answers, but to sing and declare boldly before God. It is well with my soul. I want God's word to dwell so richly in you that our first response is shaped by God's word. When we prioritize our worship of God, it is then that we can see greater fruit in our fellowship, 
in our discipleship and in our evangelism and in our missions. Those are all critically important. But we will fail unless they flow out of our relationship with God through Christ. Our first priority as Christians and as a church must be an active pursuit of a living and vital relationship with Christ that we would be truly connected to the vine, and through that we would bear much fruit. We must abide in him as his words fill us and as we lift our prayers to him. We must abide in his love as we seek to obey his commandments. If we pursue this in our personal relationships and our corporate meetings, I am convinced that we will grow in our unity with one another our second priority, and in our witness to the world, our third priority. May it be so in our hearts. We're going to pause for a moment and be silent before the Lord because each of us have to respond to God's word. Each of us have to look at our lives and consider, how am I being shaped by the vine dresser? Do I need pruning in my life? Do I need to cast myself before the Lord and ask him for wisdom? How can I better know you? How can I better abide in you? If you're here today and you recognize that right now you are not abiding in Christ, if Christ came today, you would be one of those branches that would be cast out and set aside to wither and to be cast into fire. Today is the day of salvation, and I pray that you would trust Christ. But for those of us who are in Christ, who are abiding in him, that we would continue to abide in him. So let's pray before the Lord now.